Wormwood, I note with great displeasure that the enemy has, for the time being, put a forcible end to your direct attacks on the patient's chastity. You ought to have known he always does in the end, and you ought to have stopped before things reached that stage. For as things stand now, your man has learned the dangerous truth that these attacks do not last forever, and so you can never again use against him what is one of our most powerful weapons, the belief of ignorant humans that there is no way to get rid of us except by yielding. I suppose you've tried convincing him that chastity is unhealthy. I haven't yet got a report from you on the young women in the neighborhood. I should like it at once, for if we can't use his sexuality to make him unchaste, we must use it for the promotion of a desirable marriage. In the meantime, I will give you some advice on the type of woman, I mean the physical type, which you should encourage him to fall in love with, if falling in love is indeed the best we can manage. In a rough and ready way, of course, this matter is already decided for us by spirits far deeper down in the lowerarchy than you or I. It is the business of these great masters to produce in every age a general misdirection of what may be called sexual taste. They do this by working through the small circle of popular artists, dressmakers, and advertisers who determine the fashionable type. The aim is to guide each sex away from members of the other with whom spiritually helpful, happy, and fertile marriages are most likely. Thus we have for many centuries triumphed over nature in making secondary aspects of the male, such as the beard, disagreeable to nearly all females, and there is more in this than you might suppose. With regards to male taste, we have varied some. At one time, we have directed it to the statuesque and aristocratic type of beauty, mixing men's vanity with their desires and encouraging the race to breed primarily from the most arrogant and prodigal women. At another, we have selected an exaggeratedly feminine type, faint and languishing, so that folly and cowardice and all the falseness and littleness of mind that go along with them shall be at a premium. At present, we are on a version of this, and we now teach men to like women whose bodies are scarcely able to support themselves due to absolute slenderness. Since this is a kind of beauty even more transistory than most, we thus aggravate the female's chronic horror of growing old with many excellent results, and also make her less willing and less able to bear children. And that is not all. We have engineered a great increase in the license which society allows to the representation of the apparent nude. Not the real nude. It's all fake, of course. The figures in popular art are falsely drawn. The real women in bathing suits and tights are all pinched in and propped up, making them appear firmer and more slender than nature allows any real full-grown woman to become. Yet at the same time, the modern world is taught to believe it is being frank and healthy and getting back to nature. As a result, more and more, men's desires are being directed towards something which does not exist. The role of the eye in sexuality becomes more and more important, while its demands become more and more impossible to attain. The results you can easily forecast. That is the general strategy of the moment. But inside that framework, it is possible for you to direct your patient's desires in one of two directions. If you look inside any man's heart, you will find that he is haunted by two imaginary women, a terrestrial and an infernal Venus, and that his desire differs qualitatively between the two objects. There is one type for which his desire is such as to be naturally amenable to the enemy, readily mixed with kindness, readily obedient to marriage, and colored all through with the golden light of reverence and naturalness which we detest. There is another type which he desires brutally, and desires to desire brutally. This type is best used to keep him away from marriage altogether. However, even within marriage, he would treat her as a slave, an idol, or an accomplice. His love for the first might lead to what the enemy calls evil, but only accidentally. He might wish that she was not someone else's wife, so that he could love her lawfully. But in the second type, the felt evil is what he wants. It is that tang in the flavor that he is after. In the face, the visible animality, sulkiness, craft, or cruelty. And in the body, not what he would normally call beauty, something in a sane hour he might even call ugliness, but by our craft it can be turned into that which plays on the very raw nerve of his obsession. The real use of the Infernal Venus is, of course, as prostitute or mistress. But if your man is a Christian, and if he's been well trained in that nonsense about irresistible, all-excusing love, he often can be persuaded to marry her. And that is very well worth bringing about. You will have failed as far as fornication and solitary vice. But there are other, more indirect methods of using a man's sexuality to be his undoing. And, by the way, they are not only efficient, but they are very delightful. The unhappiness produced is exquisite and long. <laughs> <laughs>